I mean, that's that's cool. We want to stay in the dark as long as we can. All right. Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and call to order the August 22nd meeting of the Capitola City Council. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Morgan? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brooks? Here. And Mayor Brown? Here. Uh, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I skipped the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Can we have a report on closed session? Good evening. A closed session was had on the item on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Do we have any additional materials for tonight's meeting? Staff received one letter and email um, for item 8A. It's been provided to the City Council and was added to the agenda packet for public review. Great. All right. We will move on now to item 5, oral communications by members of the public. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Council on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. Uh, please feel free to state your name if you would like it included in the record. Good evening. Well, hey, good evening. My name is usually James Ewing Whitman, so I'll certainly identify myself that way. You know, the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz took a six-week break. But this, you guys met two weeks ago. So, wow, well, there have been so many things going on in, all around the world and in U.S. politics. I don't even really know where to begin. It seems like... Uh, People can look up and don't believe a word I say, do your own research, but the only difference between only difference between human blood, hemoglobin, and plant chlorophyll is we are iron based and plants are magnesium based. So something that came up uh, in the city of Santa Cruz, I'm, second time I commented, county of Santa Cruz, second time I commented. Well, the first time I commented, I got there right on time, and there were over 150 people in there, but because I sat in the corner and I knew when to stand up and go to the front, I spoke first. I had to leave the room because after the third person mentioned breastfeeding and chest feeding, I just had to leave. I just can't believe our educational system. I came back to comment on another note, and I don't know, I... I don't know if I have a sense of humor, but I think the only thing as ridiculous as chest feeding would be fossil fuels. Because um, John D. Rockefeller and a bunch of other criminals in 1892 met in Geneva and it's like, hey, how can we create scarcity? How can we start to eliminate hemp? And how can we stop? How can we start to eliminate the natural process of making alcohol, which is pretty much stupid simple? I know, I can do it. So, you know, I'm here to kind of promote a buddy of mine that apparently distributed hundreds of thousands of these in English and Spanish all over. Just over, I invited him to say this himself, but he was too busy, about 55 seconds. So I guess I'm here because I actually kind of care about my community, and I'll probably be speaking on an item that kind of comes up, which is really has a lot to do with when you walk out this room and you look at the flagpole, you see a California and a U.S. flag. And then in this room, you see a California flag with the gold maritime pirate fringe and a California flag. And there really is an incredibly strong distinction. You know, this nation, some people say, was only a constitutional republic for seven years. And... Uh, I don't know what else to say. I don't really want to. I couldn't imagine myself running for any political party except maybe the Handsome Devil Party or as a county sheriff because there is a strong difference between a constitutional republic sheriff and what most of what we have now, which is a constitutional corporate democratic democide sheriff. So thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, guys. I'd like to start by saying this is not a comment on item 8A, so there's no need to interrupt me. Uh, hello, neighbors. Start again, right? I got time. Hello, neighbors. I'm here to advocate for missing middle housing. 
also called horizontal multifamily or gentle density. These are small builds that fit into any neighborhood, cottage courts, fourplexes, uh, small apartment buildings, two stories, bungalows. All it would take for us to add this gentle density would be a few tweaks to our SB9 implementation, adopting AB 1033 like San Jose did, and adding a bonus ADU program similar to many coastal cities around the country. State, let's call it, go with that probably. We need to build, but we don't need to build high rises or pick and choose the density where it will be. We can let the natural traditional development pattern do its job. Uh, so again, missing middle, horizontal multifamily, gentle density. These are the solutions to our problems and budgets. Thanks guys. Any additional public comment? Hi, welcome. We're hearing a lot in the news about MPOX, right? Monkeypox, MPOX. So there's, we can understand what's going on by coming to a meeting. I read from the flyer Monkeypox, the gain of function story. This is Tuesday, July 27th, at the Aptos Grange, 2555 Marvista Drive, 6 o'clock. In March, reading from the flyer, 2020, 2021, the Nuclear Threat Initiative partnered with the Munich Security Conference to conduct a tabletop exercise on reducing high consequence biological threats. Conducted virtually, the exercise examined gaps in national and international biosecurity and pandemic preparedness architectures and explored opportunities to improve capabilities to prevent and respond to high consequence biological events. Participants included 19 senior leaders and experts from across Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe with de decades of combined experience in public health, biotechnology industry, international security, and philanthropy. The exercise scenario portrayed a deadly global pandemic involving an unusual strain of monkeypox virus that emerged in the fictional nation of Rhenia and spread globally over 18 months. Ultimately, the exercise scenario revealed that the initial outbreak was caused by a terrorist attack using a pathogen engineered in a laboratory with inadequate biosafety and biosecurity provisions and weak oversight. By the end of the exercise, the official pandemic resulted in more than 3 billion cases and 270 million fatalities worldwide. So this was this virtual tabletop exercise that we're doing to in March 2021. Now here we are today. Um, so that's at the Aptos Grange 255 Mar Vista, July 27th at 6. And again, to recommend this book, The Unfortunate Truth About Vaccines, Exposing the Vaccine Orthodoxy by Leon Canneron. Uh, the second edition is recently out. Should be required Thank reading. You. Thank you. Thank you. Additional public comment this evening. Hi, welcome. Um, I'm Sham Vandervoort from Santa Cruz County Bank, and I'm actually here to say thank you. Santa Cruz County Bank has been serving our community. We're in our 20th year now, um, and want to thank you, City of Capitola, for putting your money where your life is. We are honored to be your banking, banking partner, um, and we look forward to what this partnership can build and helping serve our communities and our businesses going forward. So we truly are thankful and grateful to be working with you and look for a great future ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I just wanted to um, 
Don't remember what a great night we had um, Tuesday night uh, from the Measure Y kickoff. Um, it was great to see a lot of our community members come out and support the measure. And um, we'll be kicking off um, our campaign. So there's a couple of fellow other citizens um, that are working on the campaign as well as council members. And we'll be out walking neighborhoods and putting up signs and hope everybody can support the measure Y as it moves forward. So thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment this evening? All right, seeing none, we will bring it back to staff and city council comments. We'll start with staff. Any comments? I'm looking at the back of the room, and I don't think we have any comments this evening. Okay, we'll bring it to the city council. Any comments at this end? Yeah, council member Clark. Yeah, I'll start off. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention that we're going to have a beach cleanup saved. Our shores and city of Capitola will be holding their uh, cleanup this weekend, 9 a.m. to 11. Esplanade Park, I'll be there. Hopefully some other folks will be there too. Thanks. Please. Um, I just want to remind the community, if you have not noticed, that school is back in session, which means lots and lots of youth out there walking around early in the morning. Um, the elementary and middle schools are about 15 minutes apart from start times, and so that just impacts a longer um, just a little bit of more of a wait when you're trying to commute around. Um, I also, on that note, just want to encourage, I know we had funding for helmets and lights and little back pedals, and the last we talked about it at council was that um, some of our officers would be carrying it around in their cars to give out to the youth who are not wearing their helmets, and I just want to remind them it's that time of year to, to continue that work that we started last year. Um, Additionally, there are applications. As you know, we're partners with the Youth Action Network, and there is a youth liaison um, opening for, uh, for Capitola, which means that students who attend SoCal High School can apply um, to be in a, li a government liaison with uh, Councilmember Clark and I, lucky them, and um, learn more about our, our government. And then lastly, I think we received it today that there is an opening for all youth of all eight grades for mayor for a day. This is actually something I believe our mayor herself brought to council um, a few years ago, and we've been able to see such a tremendous um, uh, people or a tremendous amount of students applying for it. So um, all school related, all youth related today, but um, just be careful out there with the, with the kiddos. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? No? Okay. All right. Uh, that will conclude our staff and city council comments. We'll move on to our consent items. Uh, does any member of the council want to move any item from consent? Seeing none. I will move the consent items 7A through G. I'll second that. Okay. And before we vote, uh, the Brown Act, uh, California Government Code Section 54953C3 requires the city to report an oral summary prior to taking action on executive compensation, which is on our consent agenda this evening. And this is that summary. Item 7G is approval of a contract with Burke, Williams, and Sorensen for city attorney services. It reappoints Samantha, Samantha Zettler as our city attorney for the next five years. Either party may terminate the contract at any time. The contract sets the rates for attorneys and paralegals, which are stated in the staff report, and permits an annual increase of $5. With that, can we have, oh, we don't need a roll call. Uh, can we all in favor say aye, please? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, sir, we've already uh, closed public comment. Can I call a point comment. of order, please? We've already closed public comment for today, sir. No, I'm not. Can I call a point of order, please? Uh, I'm going to turn to my city attorney. I don't believe that a point of order is called no. outside of the council. The council can no. call points of order. Yeah, I'm sorry, Please. sir. Okay. Public that, that's totally okay. This is public being recorded, comments. and that's fine. I was calling a point of order, and your attorney sure. is saying that I can't call a point that's of correct. order. This is recorded, isn't it? Yes? Yes. Thank you. All right, we will move on uh, to item 8A, which is our citywide housing element readoption. So before we kick off, I just want to take us all back in time a little bit, back to 2021, <laughs> and remind everybody about how far we've come. Uh, at that point, AMBAG was working on allocating 
whole bunch more units, our association of governments, than we'd ever been re received in our region. And staff was working with our mayor, Kristen Brown, who is on the MA board. We provided a lot of feedback. Um, working with Mayor Brown to AMBAG staff about the methodologies that they were using to allocate the units to the various cities. Unfortunately, AMBAG never ended up taking the recommendations and the input that we received. And so we ended up getting 1,336 units, which was something like a hundred fold increase from previous housing elements. So that was where we started. And then everyone at that point will remember several years ago, we kicked off our housing cycle. So. I just want to thank everybody who's been involved and particularly Director Hurley for all the work to get us to this point this evening because it's been a really long path and a lot of work by a lot of people. So with that, I'll turn it over to Katie. Well, thank you. Thank you. It has been a, a long journey and I'm excited to be here. A little deja vu. We were here last November and here we are again for the re-adoption of our housing element. Um, next slide, please. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the housing element. I'll give a quick overview, the revisions of the housing element, and then we'll move into city council adoption. Next slide, please. Um, so first, I would like to also give a lot of thanks to our team. We, we have one of the best teams around, and RRM is uh, design group was the lead, and they really made kept us organized and brought us through on time. Veronica Tam and Associates is made up of Veronica and Lori. And I believe they're both on the Zoom this evening, so I don't know if we can pull up. I'll, I'll make them visible here. And then uh, Layla Shoshref Denrich. Denrich, sorry. Um, she's with Burke, and she's been just wonderful in keeping us in, um, on time and making sure that we're in alignment with the state law. And then Colette Morse, who's done all the CEQA work, the uh, California Environmental Quality Act work. So. Um, with that, I'm going to pull up the other presenters, or um, I guess, well, I'm going to present to you, but I, I, I'm not sure how to get, sorry, I'm going to see if I can pull up Veronica as well. Okay, there we go. Hi, Veronica. Um, so our recommendation tonight will be to adopt the addendum to the General Plan Update Environmental Impact Report and also to amend the 2023-2031 housing element of the General Plan. I, I won't read this all right now, but we'll read it at the very end. But updating timelines as presented in the slideshow and then um, and directing staff to resubmit to the HCD state. Next slide, please. So what is a housing element? It's one of the seven required um, elements within your general plan, which is your blueprint for the future of a city. It's an assessment of what do we need in terms of housing and how, how to plan for that in the future and make sure we can accommodate that housing. The deadline for our housing element was back in December of 2023. We, we have it, had it in on time, um, but we did, um, the next part is that it goes out to HCD at the state. And um, when they reviewed it, they had additional Corrections. So next slide, please. So here we are in the housing element process. Uh, we're at the HCD reviewed it. We got a conditional letter of certification and we are in re-adoption. If you can click forward. We're also in our housing element implementation. So I just want to pause here for a minute and, and really focus in on this. So the housing element cycle began in January of this year. We've been working really hard on implementation while we're still working on re-adoption. So what that means is the Planning Commission has had six meetings to date on zoning code updates to remove hurdles from housing within our zoning code. Um, we've worked with you all on the budget cycle for the, this year to be able to, in the, in the coming year, start um, a, a housing a deposit for when people, first time home buyer deposit programs. So we'll, be kicking that off after we have an adopted housing element, as well as uh, funding for housing rehab, which is a great need in Capitola as we have an aging housing stock. So two exciting programs to come to you next year. In one of my slides, I'll be talking about the mall and also multifamily and how that, that we're also gonna be updating two sections of our code in 2025. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide goes over the outreach to date I think everyone's seen my um, 
I've sent out a lot of emails. Every time we have a new draft of the housing element, we get the word out to everyone in the community that's interested and has um, asked to be notified. Next slide, please. Um, back last year, this is just a list of the adoption hearings. So back in November 9th, 2023, City Council adoption. Next slide, please. And on January 12th, unfortunately, we received that letter um, from HCD. They asked us to focus in, have more of a commitment in our housing element regarding the, um, the Capitola Mall incentives program and to commit to a height and floor area. Typically you would do that at the zoning code stage, but um, they wanted to see a commitment within our housing element. Also um, updating our sites inventory and putting more analysis in the overall document about non-vacant sites. Capitola is mostly built out, so we had to document uh, the reasons for our assumptions behind how how housing was going to build out in the future and then also asking us to remove references to the publicly owned sites uh, owned by the state um, so we had originally included new brighton we also talked about um, the dmv site and they they said you can we'll start discussing this with you over the next year but you cannot include those in your site's inventory so next slide please um, so we, su we um, submitted several drafts, and I want to be clear that when we submit this draft to the HCD, this will officially be our third draft that goes to HCD. In the emails to the public, it's much easier to see a sequence, and so I've been saying first, second, third, fourth, but these, this will be our official third draft. These in-between drafts was our way of really working with HCD to get conditional compliance before we get adoption. So. Tonight, when you re-adopt, this will actually be the third official draft going to HCD. Um, so the amendments, I'm not going to read through this list. I gave you a, a summary of basically um, they needed more um, information on realistic capacities and showing examples of redevelopment throughout Capitola. There's also three items on this list um, tied to the Capitola Mall, and then also removing those state sites. So next slide, please. So within the mall, um, they did ask for more analysis of realistic capacity. So we, um, we did an economic study that we'll be bringing to you in October. Um, we're just finishing that up, but it supports the fact that at the mall, they'll need 48 to 60 dwelling units per acre. They, would, they need a height of 75 feet and that to um, remove the parking garages from the calculation makes the, the project economically feasible. Also removing barriers. So we've committed to um, more objective standards um, that can be measured rather than um, community character standards. So really talking about how design, um, how design fits within um, design standards that are more objective. And then also a commitment to 15% lower income at 266 units at the mall and 5% moderate, which is 89. So really following our um, inclusionary housing ordinance and um, applying that to the site. Next slide, please. Um, so we also updated program 1.6 for, it's the commitment to a 75 foot height and next. And also um, an update to program 1.7 for the commercial shopping and redevelopment. And this is a commitment. Um, there's a lot of timing involved in this program 1.7. And it also is a commitment to revisit the financial feasibility on an annual basis. So I am going to propose tonight that we um, do one revision to program 1.7. I reached out to the HCD and they're in support of this just due to the timing and amount of work that we're currently doing for implementation. So next slide, please. So um, the majority of the updates this round is based on the mall. And originally we had said in January, at being very optimistic, I'm like, we can get this done in 2024, no problem. But here we are um, almost in September. We have at our next planning commission meeting, we're, we're modifying our density bonus chapter and we we really have a big package that you're that's going to come to you late September early October and this is just readjusting that the, all the mall standards we're going to kick them off early in the year but 
um, that we have time and we're not, um, not required to have them completed by the end of this year. So just um, changing those dates as shown in these bullets from 2024 to 2025. And then in the last bullet, it's talking about the feasibility analysis. And since we just finished a feasibility analysis that we'll bring to you in October, um, it wouldn't be practical to do one next year. We'll do one the following year because it's very current. Um, so uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. So with that, um, it's an exciting night. We're here to readopt our housing element. And also we have a lot of programs in the housing element that we're really looking forward to bringing to Capitola and just really strengthening um, our housing program overall. So um, with that, our recommendation tonight is to adopt a resolution approving the Planning Commission recommendation to adopt the addendum to the General Plan Update Environmental Impact Report and amend the 2023 to 2031 housing element of the General Plan as conditionally approved by the California Department of Housing and Community Development and updating timelines as presented for Program 1.7 and direct staff to submit the amended housing element to the state of California for certification. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have before we go to public comment. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I know we didn't want to go through all of the um, amendments, Katie, but can you just uh, touch on item 10, the edits to the emergency shelters a little bit more? Sure. Um, under state law, we're required to um, to amend our code for shelters to allow them by right in certain areas. So that's an amendment that you'll be seeing. Um, I don't know, Veronica, do you want to touch upon that a little more? Uh, sure. Um, new state law that was passed in, I think, 2023, um, uh, AB 2339 basically says that you have to um, allow uh, at least one emergency shelter to be located within your community in zones that actually allows for residential uses. In the past, this this requirement has always been there, but the, the only difference is in the past, you can put emergency uh, shelters in non-residential zones. Um, and the new state law says, no, you need to put it in a zone that is suitable for residential uses, suitable for suitable for habitation. Um, um, therefore, you have to identify a zone that allows for residential uses. And that's the change that we're doing because currently your zoning code put it in a zone that does not allow for residential uses. So we're moving it to a zone that does allow residential or mixed use. Um, and so that's just to comply with state law. It doesn't mean that you will have to build a shelter um, it still is dependent on interest and funding from nonprofit, but you do have to ident identify a zone that um, is considered to be suitable for um, uh, uh, living environment. Great, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Uh, with that, we will bring this to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now is the time. Hi, welcome back. Remove hurdles. What does that mean specifically to remove hurdles? And did uh, I hear something about height, 70 some feet high allowed? Well, it's hard to hear from me in here sometimes. So that's another question. And um, sounds like you're considering building in the mall and uh, in the Department of Motor Vehicles site as well as the possibility DMV site. Is that what I heard? And um, it just seems like everywhere it's starting to look like Silicon Valley South <laughs> with all the buildings going up all over at excessive height. Um, what I'd like to see is a requirement to not have cell towers and Wi-Fi that harm the community and the wildlife. Um, so if you could answer those, because um, um, I'd like to see Capitola as an aesthetically beautiful, pleasing environmental place. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any further comment on this item? Hello, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Jerry Jensen again. Um, I just wanted to um, elaborate a little bit on uh, what uh, Jamie's uh, comment was about um, how hard everybody's been working. I wanted to really point out the planning um, that's gone into from our public, uh, from our uh, planning department uh, with Katie and Brian and Sean. They've been amazing. And then also um, the planning commission lead, uh, led by um, our ch chair, uh, Courtney Christensen, uh, Susan Westman, uh, Peter Wilkes, and also Paul Esty. They been amazing to work with and their hard work is very much appreciated so just wanted to acknowledge that so thank you thank you any further comments hi welcome no no problem uh Good afternoon, evening. Joanna Carmen with MidPen Housing. I'm our Vice President of Housing Development. I run our development team. Um, as you know, MidPen Housing is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. We have over 13 communities here in Santa Cruz County. Um, we're currently working one on here in Capitola. And just want to commend staff and council for your dedication to continuing to work so hard on this housing element. The need out there is immense. Every time we open um, the wait list for the application period for any one of our new communities, we get thousands of applications for typically less than 100 units, sometimes around 50. So the need's there, so really appreciate all the hard work staff's done, and, and thank you for all of your leadership in this effort to build more affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Last call for public comment. Okay. Oh. Hi, welcome. Hi, Melinda Orbach. Um, I, I do believe that in order for a community to be resilient, that we need to be proactive. Um, we live in an evolving and changing world. Um, I want to reshift the conversation about affordable housing to really be workforce housing because our staff can't even afford to live here. Um, and I think it's important if we want to visualize the kind of community we want in Capitola, that people who work here should also be able to live here. And, you know, affordable housing is um, for a family of four with two kids is $145,000. So that's the salary of maybe two teachers or, you know, our um, public works folks. Um, so really, housing is not, I mean, I think for some, housing is, is a scary thing. Um, bigger buildings and change in the, in, the, in, the, in the city that you've known and grown up in. But um, I think this is what we need. We have a housing crisis. And housing is a regional issue. Um, so I, I think Capitola should do all that we can do to help mitigate some of those issues. And when people can live where they work and get the services and opportunities where their community is, we will build stronger communities. And people will be less reliant on cars. We can bike and walk to places. We can have nodes of community where people can congregate and get to know each other and hang out with their neighbors. Um, parents can spend less time in their cars commuting to work and spend more time with their children and being actively engaged in, in, in politics or in their community to volunteer. So thank you for all that you're doing, Katie, and for the city and for the council to be um, building more affordable housing, workforce housing for the people who live in this community. Thanks. Thank you. Any further public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council for um, additional discussion and a vote. Any discussion? Yeah. I would uh, like to say that I am for affordable housing really appreciate all the work the staff has done, city council, the planning department, but I want to express some of my concerns. One, I don't believe this is a good law. 
Yeah, it's the state's making us do some things that uh, are, are taking a lot of us in capital out of our comfort zone. Um, one of the things we need to worry about is how we progress and we need to see how things go and be really careful in the future when we build these big projects. Um, I don't like the way it's going, how they're taking our local control away. It's, uh, it's difficult. So we really need to be careful and keep an eye on it. But again, kudos to the city. You guys have done a great job um, getting this project done. It's been a few years. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any comments? Yeah, I just want to, again, congratulate you and thank you for all the hard work and all the people that have been a part of this. Um, and I'm excited to see how we can move forward as a city and um, hopefully this will allow us to become more inclusive and gain some more affordability. Thank you. Thank you. Woman? Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted uh, to echo what everyone else is saying about the huge amount of work that has been done on this. One of the things that um, was shared with me is that one way to maintain our control is with good planning. And when we have the opportunity, gosh, now since 2021, you said, of good planning, this is our opportunity to, to do so. So I'm hoping third time is a charm and that we get this passed because the work that our planning commissioners have done, the work that staff has done into this housing element of just planning is exceptional. So um, that's one way we're going to do this right um, is by ensuring that uh, we continue to plan wisely to support the communi community um, growth and the members that need housing here. Um, so with that, I'd like to move forward with staff's recommendation to adopt the resolution, or excuse me, adopt the addendum to the general plan update environmental impact report and amend the 23 to 2031 housing element of the general plan as conditionally approved by the California Department of Housing and Community Development and updating timelines as presented for program 1.7 and direct staff to submit the amended housing element to the state of California for certification. I'll second. Uh, any further comments? No? Okay. Uh, I just want to make a couple quick comments. So first I want to echo what everyone else has said, thanking staff and our planning commissioners and uh, everyone that's done so much work on this. Uh, it's a long time coming. Um, and, I, and I understand that the kind of, uh, I, I can't think of another word other than maybe sticker shock that, you know, in the last Rena cycle, we had what, 300? We had to plan for like 300 houses? Less. Less than that. Less than that. And now to go to 1336 from, and I was assuming it was 300, 300 to 1336 is almost a 450% increase in the housing units we had to plan for it. We desperately need them, of course, but I understand the concerns for such a, a large number of housing units that we suddenly have to plan and zone for. Um, this RENA cycle was new across the state. They had new requirements for cities, uh, new ways that they determined the allocations. It was um, a brand new process that's, that the Housing and Community Development Department has never done before. And so cities up and down the state of California have been experiencing these multiple hundreds of percentage uh, increases in their their housing numbers, uh, so much so that uh, I think it was the Attorney General uh, kind of investigated the process and gave some recommendations to HCD. So there may be some changes next time this happens uh, in, is it six years, Katie, or eight? It's eight. an eight-year cycle, but, but seven it's six more. six years from now. Yeah, seven, seven more now. Um, so, so just uh, all that to say... Um, you know, this this has been quite an experience, I think, for staff and for planning and for the whole community. And we're all in this together as this new process unfolds. Um, as uh, Vice Mayor Brooks mentioned, that some of this is about maintaining local control for uh, communities who did not or will not or are kind of refusing to manage uh, to pass a housing element are subject to the builder's remedy. And in that case, uh, developers can come in and build whatever they want with, with no restrictions because there is no no... Um, plan that's been passed to uh, determine what they can and can't do. And so this is, to a certain degree, a small uh, bit of that local control. But I, I do also understand, um, you know, the concerns around local control uh, being taken away. And so there's a little bit of a, a tug of war, I think, in my opinion, 
um, between this being uh, kind of a blessing and a curse, right? But in the long run, housing, we need it, and I'm glad that we're moving forward, uh, especially with the planning for the affordable housing. Um, and then, Katie, if you could just, um, sorry to just kind of spring this on you, but it just popped into my mind. Um, so I know that there have been concerns shared in the community about, okay, if all of this new development comes, what does that mean for our infrastructure? And can you talk a little bit about, like, the feasibility of something like a development agreement where there could be some kind of development and in the agreement with that they would, you know, signalize an intersection or improve a road or whatever the case may be so that development happens in a way that can benefit the community and not just pull from the resources we already have. Can you talk about what that what that means and if that's possible? I, I can. And that's something that's actually come up at our planning commission a lot. So throughout this process, the, the planning commission has been amazing and uh, working through the, the updates. But that, that question has come up quite a bit. Um, as we move through and proposals come in, each proposal will be reviewed as its own project. And it'll also be reviewed under um, CEQA to, to look at impacts. And um, in really large projects such as the mall, we would be looking at a development agreement and really looking at each piece of that. So transportation being one of the larger pieces, uh, we do work with the city of Santa Cruz Water District in order to make sure they can accommodate water. But looking at every piece um, and being able to uh, further work with the developer and fine tune and make sure that the impacts um, are, are mitigated. So... With it, if we need a new traffic light, we can add a new traffic light. If we need to remove a traffic light, we can. And that's something that as we go through the process and we realize what the impacts are associated with each development, um, we can do those negotiations. I appreciate that. I know there's been, uh, it's been brought to my attention some concerns in the community that the city isn't addressing the need for additional services and infrastructure. And so I think that it's important that um, the community hears that from you, that, that there are opportunities for us to ensure that accommodations are made to uh, address the impacts of new development. So I appreciate you um, sharing that. Okay, uh, any other comments? No? Okay, uh, with that, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We will move on to item 8B, Affordable Housing Development Loan Amendment. More affordable housing, I love it. Here we are in implementation. This is the fun stuff. Um, so before you tonight is an amendment to our loan agreement with Mid Penn, who is the developer at the 1098 38th Avenue site. Next slide, please. Um, our recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution which will modify the existing loan. So next slide, please. Um, so 1098 38th Avenue was approved by the Planning Commission this year, and it's a great project. It's located right next to the rail line, and it's almost on two acres of, of land, and they're developing at 27 dwelling units per acre for a total of 52 units, and it's 100% affordable. And it's a unique community in that there's more to it than just housing. They'll have um, be providing services to people at um, two people, the residents there. And I'll, I'll let Joanna tell you more about that when they come up for comment. But next slide, please. So here you can see the layout. There's four buildings. They've got a central um, open space area and playground area for kids. There's um, bicycle parking, seven, seven short-term bike parking spaces, and then 52 long-term bike parking spaces, so really looking into the future and that mobility connection. They've got EV chargers. There will be four that are installed. Seven will be capable and then 17 ready, so all the infrastructure will be there to um, add more EV as it's needed. And with the 52 units, there are one, two, and three bedroom units and a total of 70 parking spaces. Um, this is near a lot of our, near the Capitola Mall in close proximity and also 41st Avenue in which we do have uh, better metro service on that, on that main corridor. Next slide, please. So just some beautiful images of the buildings, three stories high. Uh, you can see this, the top view is from the interior and just you can see the, the spaces for people to gather and spend time together as residents. 
And then also the northwest view is on the bottom from the courtyard. So um, it's got some really nice architecture tied to it and traditional materials that you typically see in, in a lot of Capitola's architecture. Next slide, please. So going back, back in November, the city council approved a loan for $250,000 through our um, housing successor agency funds. We had a loan paid off for the Castle Mobile Home Park, which was about $2 million, and we can utilize that towards affordable housing. Um, the Planning Commission approved the project in April, and then MidPen sent in a letter in June asking for um, the city to come up with, to provide the gap funding, which is an additional 1.3 million. Next slide, please. So we have two sources of, of funding for this. The first I refer to as the PLAHA, the Permanent Local Housing Allocation. This is a great new source of money that for every real estate transaction that takes place within the city of Capitola, $75 a $75 fee is added and it goes towards this permanent local housing allocation. We don't get the full $75. I think the state gets a portion, but it's it's a nice revenue stream for us that goes right into our housing. Um, currently, um, I'm suggesting we put $428,000 of the PLAHA money towards um, this project. And then we also, as I mentioned, have money in that housing successor agency fund from that um, the Castle Mobile Home Park loan that was paid off. And we also, during the budget, I, I brought forth a few ideas on how we can also utilize that money um, for uh, down payment assistance as well as future rehabs within Capitola. Currently, we use it for our HAP, the Homeless Action Partnership, which I think was recently renamed. And I'm, um, but also the security deposit assistance that goes through CAB, and then the cab emergency housing. So um, those are current uses. So the proposed funding tonight is for 1.35 million. Um, and as I stated before, the PLHA, 428,000, housing successor agency at 921. These numbers have been updated since the staff report went out. Originally, I was suggesting that we use two years of the PLHA money, um, but the Last two years, the money significantly is, is a lot lower, about 34000 each year. So I'm suggesting rather than come back and have to modify this loan again, that we add that 70000 in to the PLHA and not take it from the housing successor agency funds. And the housing successor agency funds have more flexibility tied to them, so we can really get that out to residents in a easier, more easily than the PLHA. Um, so the recommendation, recommended action tonight is to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an amended loan agreement with MP Rail Trail Associates, LP, to increase the existing loan of 250000 by $1.35 million for a total loan of $1.6 million to fund development of 52 residential units affordable to low-income households at 1098 38th Avenue, Capitola, California, and allocate $428,872 of PLHA funds and $921,128 of housing successor agency funds there too. And with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Any questions? Nope. Questions? No? Good? Okay. Oh, sorry, I think I tried oh, to ask. Sorry. Um, Katie, just so um, for com community transparency, can you share a little bit about generally if we have somebody that wants to build condos, for instance, they come in and they build it with their own funding. Can you share a little bit about why council today would be approving with these extra dollars like a project like this? Um, sure. Because, I mean, we know the answer, right? But yeah. I just wondered if you could help clarify that. Yes. Yeah, so MidPen is an affordable housing developer, nonprofit. And they, we have a, a, there's quite a few nonprofit housing developers throughout the state of California and nationwide. And um, these funds can be utilized specifically for affordable housing development. And they um, typically have to um, qualify for low income housing, which is a, um, below 80% of AMI, area median income. So this project being 100% affordable, it, the, the funds, um, 
can be utilized for this project. If someone else were to come in with a regular condo, all the condo project, although it's providing housing, we couldn't utilize these funds if the project was not affordable and didn't meet certain criteria. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, the PLHA, the amount that we'll be using from that funding, is that draining that what we have right now or is there gonna be any residual so the current PLHA grant goes through the 2023 dollars. So soon we'll be getting more information on like how much money um, we should be getting for the 2024 dollars. So it'll never completely drain unless they get rid of the program. So there will be more funding. They just haven't given us those numbers yet. And I expect that we'll get additional funding for the last two years of PLHA because they had to make assumptions and they made the assumptions really low, um, which they might be on track with our, our real estate market has definitely slowed down, but um, we will see. So the numbers were over 100,000 for the 2020-2021 for, um, years and then for 2022, 2023, they were just below 70,000. So I, th I, feel, I think we're gonna see more money from those two years as well as moving into year 24 next. Okay, thank you. Um, Katie, this kind of um, is a little bit of a redundancy question based on what Vice Mayor Brooks asked, but just to clarify for the public, these are, these are restricted dollars that can only be used for housing development, right? They are, okay, they're restricted wanna... dollars only for affordable housing. Okay, great. Um, and then you mentioned, um, you know, the location of the development being on the rail line, has the developer been in contact with the RTC? They have. Um, they've been in contact with the RTC and also O'Neill owns the structure behind them on 41st Avenue. So O'Neill has hired a local planner who's also been involved in the planning process with them. So lots of great communication. Actually, right before we went to planning commission, MidPen agreed to make some changes to the site plan in order to uh, work with uh, the rail, the RTC. All right, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Uh, if there's no further questions, we will take this to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now is the time. And I, I should say Joanna Carmen is here tonight from Mid Penn along with Alyssa Serrano. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, welcome. I thought your question was very uh, pertinent about why is the city funding this with lack of funds and other public services that need funding to give money to a development seems to me a misuse of city funds. I would urge a no vote on this. I also wonder what of affordable really means specifically because many people cannot afford what is affordable. And uh, right now there are so many people who were uh, homeless and uh, Governor Newsom's executive order directs state and local agencies and local governments to clear the homeless. Local officials and housing matters are being funded by the state to torment the homeless. And I witnessed one of these locations by Airport Boulevard in Watsonville. Um, it seems to me we need something like uh, public housing or places where people can go. You know, during the pandemic lockdown, I call it a pandemic. The figure I went was 3.3 million small businesses were destroyed. So destroying the businesses means people can't afford rent. And the reason people are homeless is they're the working poor. They can't afford the rent. So when I see affordable, it's really questionable. And development, friend once said, oh, that really means desecration and despoilment. But it, it sounds good. 
And I, you were talking about local power being taken away. This is a huge problem. Um, I remember listening to Ralph Nader recently talking about the challenge is the structural power of the corporate state. And part of the corporate state is this big development. So I think a lot of problems here that I don't really see resolved by this. And we are getting more and more corporate state edicts, as it seems to me, that really needs to be resisted. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment on this item? Hi, welcome back. No, that's fine. Um, again, Joanna Carmen with MidPen Housing. Just want to thank staff for all of their hard work, and thank you guys all for considering this loan tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, MidPen Housing is a nonprofit affordable housing developer. We're over 50 years old, and but we're not just a nonprofit affordable housing developer. We're also an owner and um, property manager. We build all of our properties to own in the long term. We don't sell off our properties, so we build not just to be long-term owners, but to be long-term neighbors. Um, so we have a very, we also have, so we have a property management company as well. So we do all of our own property management as well as our services, which Katie referred to tonight. We have resident services activities in all of our communities. And this, the plans for each community kind of depends on what the community is calling for themselves, what the needs are. If it's seniors, obviously it would be more geared towards a senior community and activities. And then in families, it can range from workforce um, supports and or financial literacy or youth and or um, after school programming. So it ranges in different communities. Um, and then just to the questions about um, affordable housing. Here, so because we are affordable housing, that means we are it's income restricted and it's also rent restricted. So here in Santa Cruz County and at this development in particular, the rents would range for studios in would range for like at the low end 900 up to three bedrooms could be at the high end of our income levels at 2500 or so. So that's sort of the range of the different rents. It's a lot more complicated. We could send charts, but that's the range of what you'll see from the extremely low income up to this um, low income at 60% of area median income here in Santa Cruz. And yeah, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all of your time tonight. Thank you. Any additional comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council for discussion and a vote. Any discussion on this end? Comments? Yeah, go ahead. Joanna. I'm sorry if you can come back up so I can ask a um, just a follow up. Um, I was reading over the letter you sent to staff, um, which was really informative to to Katie. Um, there's mention of the the partnership with SoCal School District and the county office. I I think that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Um, you just also mentioned seniors um, and and waiting for you know, to see what type of applicant. So I, I just want to see if you've done any of that work or outreach to any of those, um, of any of the local agencies, um, yeah. in addition to what you mentioned in the letter. Yeah. So um, just to clarify my point on seniors, it means different senior communities. We can, um, through fair housing laws, we actually can restrict a whole community to be for seniors. And so we do have one of those, St. Stephen's um, Senior Housing, um, just not, not too far away. Um, here, it would be, it is for families, so it doesn't mean that someone who is who is technically qualified as a senior can't live there, but that's not like the, the focus of our community. Um, so we are looking for families. We are talking to the school district and including the, the countywide office of, the, of education about ways that we can support some of their families that are struggling with, with housing, and those are in early conversations, and we look forward to bringing more information as things develop. Yeah, thank you. Any comments, questions? Yeah, I'm excited about the project. I've seen what Mid Peninsula has done in our county. Uh, some great projects, They're always well kept up. Um, definitely a need for it. I appreciate that we're going to have close to adequate parking. Um, 
there's no parking in that area off street at all. So it's going to be, it'll be a challenge, but I, I liked it to see that there is parking for the residents. So appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to see this um, come to fruition. I think um, potentially with any other further development with the mall, it could be some really good sort of cohesion there. So thanks for the work. Um, so I just want to uh, comment quickly because I feel like we need to reemphasize after it was brought up in public comment that this funding is restricted and legally cannot be spent on anything other than affordable housing. We can't put it anywhere else. Um, the uh, what affordable means, I think, is a really good question and something that needs to be further explored in our community. Um, or rather not explored, but um, it's an issue because it's based on area median income and our area median income here is 130. What's our area median income here? Do you remember? I hundred? Um, I want to say 128 for a family of four. Yeah, one, one, $128,000 for a family of four. And that's set by the federal government, I believe, or the state. I can't remember the details right now, but it's not set by us. Um, and affordable means any percentage of that area median income. So 60% of the area median income or 80% of the area median income. And then as the percentages go down, it goes from moderate income to low income to very low income. And so affordable housing is anything that's below. This is 60% or lower. 60% or lower, yeah. Um, so uh, as mentioned, it's it's complicated. It's There's a whole process for calculating it. Um, but... Um, there is a, a very strong need for affordable housing in our community, and, and this is a, a great step forward in, in meeting that need. Okay, um, if that's all for discussion, we will entertain a motion. I'll go ahead and make a motion um, to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an amended loan agreement with MT Rail Trails Associates LP to increase an existing loan from 250 to just oh, by, I'll be, I'll read it actually. I know <laughs> our attorney's looking at me. By $1.3 million for a total loan of 1.557 and some change to fund developmental development of 52. Hey, Smear Brooks, the, the recommendation was updated. I'm going to pull it up on the screen. Do it again. Okay. While you're, while you're pulling it up, I just wanted to clarify that the area median income is determined by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Coming up, this is a great way to spend these funds. Okay, so I am going to read this recommended action. I'd like to make an emotion, a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute an amended loan agreement with MP Rail Trail Associates LP to increase an existing loan of 250000 by 1.3 and change for a total loan of $1.6 to fund development of 52 residential units affordable to low-income households um, at 1098 38th Avenue, Capitola, California, and allocating $428,872 of PLIA funds and $921,128 of housing successor agency funds there too. I will second that. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. We will move on now to item 8C. Coastal Commission recommendation, mod excuse me, Coastal Condition, Coastal Commission <laughs> recommended modifications to Capitola zoning code, Monarch Cove Inn. If I could just slow down a little bit, I can get my words out clearly. I know, it's that ripple I had earlier. I'm going quick. All right. Good evening, Mayor uh, and Council. Thank you. I have a staff presentation and slideshow for you on this item. Uh, thanks for the intro. This involves uh, the Monarch Cove Inn property and the three underlying lots associated with the Monarch Cove Inn. And uh, this is a return of an item that you actually already adopted. So back from the Coastal Commission with some recommendations that, uh, that I'll go over. But it impacts or changes the general plan map, zoning map, and zoning code related to these three properties in particular. 
And so just off the top, uh, we are recommending that the council adopt the resolution as presented by the Coastal Commission for the three policy items, and we included a resolution in attachment one. Next slide. So a bit of background, if you'll bear with me. Um, the original uh, impetus for this project that's before you uh, started back in 2012 through 2014 when the owner was pursuing major renovation and expansion of the inn uh, to bring it current and deal with some um, maintenance issues and then also allow it to be financially sustainable going forward. Um, ultimately, that project was withdrawn. Uh, there was a number of pretty tall hurdles and neighborhood opposition, but really it came down to a question of compatibility being at the far east end of Depot Hill neighborhood. There was a lot of uh, neighborhood opposition and the owner ended up um, withdrawing the project. And so that was in 2014. And just about that time, the city was undertaking a comprehensive zoning code update. And uh, so with the, uh, the backdrop of having their unsuccessful development project approach the city to be included in the, uh, the comprehensive zoning code update for consideration for a zone change from visitor serving to a single family R1 zone with a visitor serving overlay. And so that re request was taken under the cover of the Comprehensive Zoning Code update, uh, which took several years to develop, uh, but then ultimately was adopted by the council and sent to the, planning, or the Coastal Commission in April of 2021. And at that hearing, uh, there was some extended discussion about the Monarch Cove property in particular, and there was uh, two primary points that were uh, discussed at the meeting. One, uh, the the property owner made a pretty compelling presentation about not being uh, successful with uh, being able to renovate the property and bring it into a state of financial sustainability and also uh, communicated maybe wanting to retire or have some options with estate management. And that was countered by the Coastal Commission's position that they laid out, um, putting high value on visitor serving properties as uh, public assets and that decisions to decommission them or modify them uh, should be weighed pretty heavily and uh, taken under serious consideration. So the ultimate recommendation was to pull the Monarch Cove in properties out of the broader uh, zoning code update, which was adopted at that hearing and the direction was given to the owner and to the city to come back under a new cover just for consideration of the Monarch Cove in properties. So the owner did that, resubmitted to the city uh, as their own project proponent for a zoning code change. Uh, it was basically a repackaging of the same visitor serving to R1 with a visitor serving overlay. Uh, and then that came before the local process planning commission and city council in fall of 2022, uh, at which time the city turned and resubmitted to the coastal commission. And that kicked off a pretty extensive discussion um, multiple meetings and ultimately ended up in the compromise that you see tonight. But the owner was involved, staff was involved, and coastal staff was in, involved. Um, I'll get into some of those details, but before I do, I wanted to just talk about the process. Uh, so anytime the city does a zoning code change, the Coastal Commission considers it a change to the local coastal program and they need to certify it. So we have to submit our changes to them before they become effective. And in this case, they approved with uh, modifications. And so uh, the action tonight is the reviewing those changes. So we've got three options and you can uh, adopt it as presented, which is the staff recommendation or the second option is one more click in the middle. Uh, so we can not adopt it and that would effectively end this effort or uh, the council could provide direction and we could uh, take that direction and apply with the Coastal Commission and go back to square one. Next slide. Um, these are in the staff report. This is just to give you uh, kind of lay of the land and a mapping exhibit of existing. So the, the three lots are existing visitor serving. This is how it is on our general plan map and our zoning map now. And then what the owner proposed and what the city adopted twice was the change to R1 with the visitor serving overlay. That's the middle map. And then the compromise map is on the far right with the green box. This is what the Coastal Commission uh, modification sent back to us tonight. And in their analysis, uh, the coastal staff really got into the internal operations at the property. 
um, and took a look at the, they, they basically split the lot in half and they uh, valued the seaward side as being the, the property that accommodates the inn and the events. And then when they looked at the landward side and saw that it was a back of house, management, offices, surface parking, and actually a fair amount of undeveloped land. And so they thought that part was eligible for this zoning uh, change to R1 and visitor serving while the primary uh, functioning inside of the property would remain a visitor serving. Go to the next slide. So in terms of just text amendments and summary of the changes, uh, effectively this would repeal chapter 17.30, which is a, a chapter that's currently just dedicated to the Monarch Cove Inn as a visitor serving property. It creates a new overlay zone in 17.28, which is the visitor serving overlay, um, but it basically imports parts of 17.30 into 17.28 and creates a new subsection uh, for the Monarch Cove Inn in the overlay zone. Uh, if the property moves forward with a proposal of some kind of residential development, there's a requirement for dedication of a public pedestrian access easement. Um, this is not entirely defined, so it would be reviewed with any kind of a development, say a subdivision or a proposal for development. We would look at the final location of where that easement would go. Um, but that maintains some of the visitor serving aspect, and that was key to the Coastal Commission. It also allows the owner uh, the flexibility they desired in um, reverting the property back to residential use, more compatible with surrounding land uses, and allows them additional flexibility with their estate management. And then, of course, retains the Monarch COVID, albeit on a smaller piece of property uh, and on the coastal side as a coastal resource. And so just looking at uh, some of the eventualities with how this would play out, we did a, a parking feasibility study. So this was just to look at some of the geometry and spatial accommodation of how to bring parking, which is currently on the R1 uh, designated properties on this map. They would need to move uh, over to the VS and then over by the inn. So this is the basic parking layout. Um, certainly with a development, we'd look at something more, more detailed, but this, it passed the initial test of feasibility, so parking would likely be relocated. And it would probably be tied to uh, either subdivision improvements or conditions of approval with a residential development on the other half of the property. And then one final thing uh, to point out is there's an existing condition of approval on the conditional use permit that regulates weddings and events at the property and it had a, a fairly forward-looking condition uh, that reads, if the Monarch Cove Inn is not operated jointly on all three properties, then lodging may continue, but no wedding events are permitted. So again, in the eventuality of some kind of modification or separation of ownership of the property, if they're not all operated jointly, then um, the wedding and events conditional use permit would be void. So with that, uh, we have attached uh, the resolution number one and we're recommending adoption of these modifications from the Coastal Commission to the Zoning Code, Zoning Map, and the General Plan Map. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. If there are any. Questions? Okay, go ahead. Um, two questions. One, starting with just the, I'm just trying to understand the, the CUP permit. So, one more time for me. If they, they don't, so if yeah, if the property is not used in its current configuration with the three lots, uh, then the weddings and events would no longer be permitted on the property. But would all three lots, what if there's different owners for each lot? And the new owner for where the Monarch Cove Inn is wants to do weddings. Is there an option for them to? They could come back in and modify, propose a modification to the use permit, but as it stands now, if the properties were managed separately, then there could be no events. And is that a city or is that the, and, and why why is that a recommendation to do that today? Well, it's, it actually goes back to the year 2000, the last time that they modified the use permit. Mm -hmm. As the, the adoption at that time included a, this condition that said if the property was ever not operated with all three properties that the I think the consideration at the time was that all three properties would continue to be used, and so that the city would need an opportunity to modify conditions if that changed. I just, I, I'm the question is 
post because I don't want to create more hurdles for somebody to have to jump through at the city level should they want to do this if it's a different owner at a different time. And, and so I'm just curious why we wouldn't leave that open or... It is an existing condition and a new owner is, is likely to come in with a probably a broader redevelopment plan as it is and which would likely include a, an amendment to the use permit. So that would be the opportunity to look at that. Interesting. Um, and then my second question is about where the owners stand today um, with these updates and what feedback they gave to Planning Commission um, to make this recommendation moving forward. Yeah, the, the owners are here. I believe they're they're ready to address the, the council, but um, we, um, we meaning city staff, coastal staff, and the owners met numerous times. We met on the property, walked the property, had a number of conference calls, meetings uh, at the city hall. So there's quite a bit of effort, and uh, the project actually was not, or the proposal was not discussed at Coastal Commission because everybody was in agreement. So the item stayed on consent at the Coastal Commission, so. Thank you. Questions? There? Okay. All right, uh, thank you. We will bring this now to public comment. If there's any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item, now's the time. Seeing none. Hi, welcome. First of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank um, Brian and Katie for helping us. It was a very arduous time and a lot of negotiations and a lot of negotiations with the Coastal Commission. Um, we wanted to actually have the whole property, obviously R1, but this compromise seems to be the best at this point in time, so we favor it. I would really just simply like to say thank you for your professionalism, your integrity in handling this thing, your sense of fairness and sensitivity to the issues that were involved for everyone. It was extremely arduous. It was extremely emotional at times for us. And you handled us with kid gloves and care. And I totally thank you so much for getting us through this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Um, I'll just start by, uh, to the homeowners, I, I think our appreciation is due to you for being able to compromise with us. And um, I just want to uh, acknowledge that you've found compromise in this really difficult situation. So thank you for both being here and standing with our staff today. So um, those are my comments. I don't want to read a long motion again. So. We need to read the whole motion. And I'm, ha I'm happy to move forward with um, the recommendation um, as presented on the agenda this evening. I will second that. And I would also like to congratulate you too for getting to this point. I know it's been a really long process emotionally and it seemingly seems to affect a lot of people even though it is your property. And so I uh, commend you for getting to this point and speaking so highly of our staff, it shows a lot about you too as well. So thank you. Did you second? I Sorry, did. I missed that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I will echo the comments uh, shared by my council members and thank you so much for um, your work with our staff. And uh, with that, we uh, have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. That'll bring us to our last... Our last item of the night, item 8D, uh, the League of California Cities Annual Conference Voting Delegate. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. This will be a short and sweet item. So every year, the League of California Cities hosts an annual conference. This year, the conference will be held in Long Beach in Southern California, October 16th through 18th. They hold a general assembly during the conference where resolutions are approved and then be, become California, League of California City policies. Uh, policy resolutions and petition resolutions may be considered during the conference. And the deadline to appoint a voting delegate to vote during the General Assembly is September 25th. Voting delegates are appointed by each member city. Capitola is a member city. Each city has one voting delegate and may appoint up to two alternates. The voting delegate must attend the conference for the General Assembly on Friday, but is not retired or required to attend the entire conference. And currently, of our five city council members, Council Member Brooks is registered to attend the conference. So tonight, for your consideration, is the recommended action to appoint one member of the city council as a voting delegate. And you may appoint one to two members of the council as alternates, but an alternate is not required. All right. Any questions? You have a question? I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> so many tonight. Um, can our alternate be... Um, can they vote via Zoom or by proxy? I don't believe so. That that's a question I would have to direct to the league. I can't answer that one with a hundred percent certainty this evening. Okay. Thanks. Um, I have a comment, not a question, so I'll hold it. Uh, okay, we will bring this to public comment. Any public comment on this item? Would you state the purposes of the League of California? I'll wait for you to be ready. <laughs> I'm talking. I was waiting. Uh, could you please state the purposes of the League of California Cities? And as a over 40 year resident of this county and having uh, attended different city council meetings and of course doing business in cities and as a citizen some of what i'd like to see at these meetings i'm very disturbed by the surveillance state we're in where there are spy cameras everywhere there's ai there's automatic license plate readers like every move is scrutinized. What I'd like to see scrutinized is what's going on in corporate boardrooms of these polluting industries and exposing that to the public. So I would like to see people speaking out against surveillance cities, the, what it's called the three minute city, surveillance cameras, uh, radiation emitting cell towers everywhere that are documented to damage wildlife and the environment. One good book on that is called The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life by Arthur Furstenberg. Um, I'd like to see preservation of forest areas and parks and uh, not expansion of freeways, which is extremely destructive. Um, so I'm just kind of suggesting some things that um, um, issues I'd like to see advocated for, including local control, which you just brought up, the previous issues of this mandatory uh, development of what's questionable affordable housing that's not affordable to many people um, so if you could respond to like the since you attend these meetings your elected official what are the stated purposes of the League of California Cities and those are my uh, recommendations thank you thank you any further comments Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Uh, and for the sake of information, I will share the League of California Cities is an organization that advocates on behalf of cities. They have policy committees that consider legislation at the state level. Um, they might approve, or excuse me, um, 
support or oppose certain legislation. They provide education and development opportunities for council members, city managers, city attorneys, and staff. Uh, the league does advocate for local control quite often. Uh, their annual conferences when the member cities come together to vote on policy and positions that will become official positions of the league. Uh, the League of California Cities has different, um, what do you call them, divisions? Mm -hmm. Divisions, yeah. They, there's the, uh, we're in the Monterey Bay Division, there's the Peninsula Division, there's a Los, I don't know what's in the Southern California, but those are the two divisions I know of because we're right here. Um, and so that's what the league is. And this is their annual conference that's happening in September, October? October. Uh, and one of our city council members will need to be the delegate for our city when it comes time for the league uh, to ask all of the member organizations, the member cities, to cast a vote on what will become official position of the League of California Cities. There's the, the you're welcome. Um, okay. Really briefly, I did do some research while you guys were um, discussing, and it looks like in order to cast a vote during the General Assembly, voters have to be present at the Assembly and in possession of a voting delegate card and a voting tool and a name badge, so it doesn't seem likely that you would be able to participate virtually or appoint a proxy since there's very specific procedures in place. Um, I know you're going. I don't know yet if I'm going to go, but based on that potential reality, I'm happy to be the alternate, if, unless anyone else is interested. No? Okay. There we go. Does anyone want to make a motion? Or I would like to make a motion. Do we need to vote on this, or do we just need to appoint someone and that's that? We should the vote, vote would be better. They do require official actions. I have to submit the minutes as proof that the vote took oh, okay. place. okay. Perfect. I move we designate Vice Mayor Brown as our Brooks. delegate. I'm sorry, Brooks. Brooks. Vice Mayor Brooks to the City League's uh, annual conference. And the alternate? Are you? Yeah. yeah. We need it in the motion, though. My, and uh, Mayor Brown. So I heard a motion by Council Member Clark to designate Vice Mayor Brooks as the delegate and myself as the alternate. And did I hear a second from you? I will second that. Okay. And I heard a second from. Um, Council Member Morgan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you so much, everyone. That brings us to the end of tonight's meeting. Our next regularly scheduled city council meeting is on September 12th uh, here in Chambers at 6 p.m. Until then, please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.